Welcome to the Lincoln Forum DEI and Infrastructure event. I'm Haley Burns, partner at River Strategies Communication Firm and one of the co-founders of Lincoln Forum, along with Pat Brady, Eric Adelstein, and Tracy Slutskin. Lincoln Forum was started to offer a platform for the most influential, engaging minds in politics and policy to speak on the most important issues facing Illinois, the Midwest, and our nation. We provide a platform for all those interested in sound public policy and bipartisan solutions. We have an incredible panel today. Leaders from both the public and private sector will be sharing their many points of view, discussing equity in our region's infrastructure, the realities of the current situation, and what we can do to make sure we don't make the same mistakes in the future. During the panel, we encourage you to ask questions using the chat function. We're gonna do our best to ask as many of those questions as we can. We'd like to thank our event partners, the Union League Club of Chicago and Politico, and our presenting sponsor, Win Trust Bank. Now I'd like to introduce Shia Kappas, political reporter for Politico and author of the Must Read Illinois Playbook. Thank you, Haley, and happy Friday to viewers of the Lincoln Forum and any guests, our panel, and to Alex Dougherty, who writes Politico's transportation newsletter. And I'm very happy to see Illinois representing on this pan panel too, Mr. Osman. Nice to see you. Uh, today's discussion on DEI couldn't be more topical for viewers across the country as states take on more construction projects made available through federal funding. These conversations give insight to big companies and small companies alike, and we hope you come away with tips on incorporating DEI into the workplace. Thanks so much. Take it away. Hi, uh, I'm Alex Dougherty. I write morning transportation um, for Politico out of Washington, D.C. Uh, you can catch that every Monday for free, um, or if you're a pro subscriber, you'll get it in your inbox every weekday morning. Um, now I'm going to introduce our panelists for today. Uh, first up is um, Omar Osman, who is the Transport Tra Transportation Secretary at the Illinois Department of Transportation. Uh, Omar Osman was appointed Transportation Secretary by Governor J.D. Pritzker in 2019. His role as Secretary reflects three decades of experience at the Illinois Department of Transportation in Engineering and Management. Moving through the IODT ranks gives him unique insight into department operations and scope, funding challenges and opportunities, as well as the need for strategic maintenance and infrastructure growth to support economic development and travel for Illinois residents. He assisted in the passage of the transportation component of, the, of Rebuild Illinois with Governor Pritzker and the General Assembly. Passed in 2019, Rebuild Illinois is investing 33.2 billion over six years into the state's aging system creating jobs and promoting economic growth. A native of Sudan, Osman came to the United States to study civil engineering at Southern University and a and College in Baton Rouge. He also earned a master's in civil engineering with an emphasis in construction management at Bradley University in Peoria. Uh, next up, we have uh, Paul Adjaba, the director of the Michigan Department of Transportation or MDOT. Paul Adjaba was appointed by Governor Gretchen Whitmer as director of the Michigan Department of Transportation in 2019. As director, he has led efforts to shepherd Gov Governor Whitmer's $3.5 billion in rebuilding Michigan road bond funding and has managed the largest transportation budgets and the most aggressive program of road reinvestment in Michigan history. Under his leadership, NDOT has championed electric and autonomous vehicle, vehicle innovations, work zone safety initiatives, and construction delivery efficiencies such as the bridge bundling program. Director Ajiba has guided the department's focus on diversity and inclusion efforts and established the barrier shattering deputy director chief culture equity and inclusion officer position within his leadership team. Ajiba holds a bachelor's of science in civil engineering from Prairie View A&M University and a master's degree in construction engineering from the University of Michigan. He is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Michigan. Next up, we have Regine Bubo, the Director of Transportation and Mobility Equity at HNTB. Regine Bubo is Senior Vice President and Director of Infrastructure and Mobility Equity at HNTB Corporation, an employee-owned infrastructure solutions firm. Ms. Bubo has spent 
35 years in regional transportation and of, has 35 years of regional transportation and infrastructure experience, specializing in the management of large and complex transportation projects. She has extensive experience on the design, build, and public-private partnership projects in the United States and Canada. Prior to her experience in the private sector, Ms. Bubo was supervising engineer for the project development section of the Mich Michigan Department of Transportation. In that capacity, she was responsible for the development and delivery of all capacity improvements and new road projects for the state of Michigan and managed a delivery budget of $3 billion. Our next panelist is John Kramer, the president of OHM Advisors. John Kramer took the reins in January 2021 as president of architecture, engineering, and planning at OHM Advisors, which has 17 offices across multiple states. A professional engineer with nearly 30 years of experience as municipal advisor, John began his career in OHM in 1993 as an intern in the municipal engineering group. Over the next two decades, he served as project engineer, principal in charge, board of directors member, shareholder, vice president, and the firm's first ever chief operating, operating officer. John is highly engaged in advocacy efforts at the local national level, lobbying legislatures in DC for more than a decade as part of the ACEC Advocacy Day and has forged partnerships in the community and industry organizations. Our next panelist is Tanya Adams, Vice President of Diversity of Inclusion at WSP. Driven by her passion for diversity and outreach, Tanya Adams has 34 years of experience in the transportation industry in serving in multiple prominent leadership roles. She was named WSP USA's Vice President for Inclusion and Diversity in March 2021 and is responsible for implementing the company's three-year strategic plan to deliver equity and equality for WSP USA employees and the communities the firm serves. Tanya works with WSP's USA business lines, regions, and functional groups to create a work environment that produces three key outcomes, a culture of trust that provides safe spaces for sensitive conversations, increased workforce diversity and advancement of WSP diversity talent, and greater support for WSP colleagues who are leaders in underrepresented communities. Prior to joining the firm, she served in leadership roles with the Illinois Department of Transportation for 19 years. Uh, so that's it for our introductions. Um, now I guess we'll, we'll get to, to questions. Um, I, as a reporter, I you know, have to lead with the news. And so I wanna get your initial reactions to what we've been seeing out of Pittsburgh this morning with the, the bridge collapse certainly is capturing national attention. It, it does seem, at least as of now, that a, a, a total disaster in terms of loss of life has been avoided, um, which is obviously good news. Um, but I think there's a lot of conversations, you know, certainly about the infrastructure law, our ability to fund uh, roads and bridges. And what I'm curious about, given the topic of, of this conversation, is when moments like this pop up, whether they're disasters or simply other opportunities for the larger uh, community who maybe doesn't think about infrastructure every day to interact with you know, a piece of, of failing infrastructure or or even a piece of, of you know, newly built infrastructure that may get a lot of attention. How can DEI be part of those conversations when there's an opportunity to capture a larger audience you know, when you see things like the Pittsburgh bridge collapse that are you know, leading the national news as we speak? I guess if we wanna start off with, with Omer, if you have any, any thoughts on that and, and then we can head sure. um, to Paul. Sure, and, and, and thank you for having us uh, today. This is a very important discussion uh, from my point of view. Uh, what took place in Pittsburgh uh, today is, is very, very unfortunate to begin with. Uh, thank goodness that we haven't lost um, lives. I know there are some injuries, but it's really telling uh, the shape of infrastructure uh, in, in our country right now. Everything that uh, we have today is, is, is 50 years old, 60 years old. Some of, the, some of those bridges are even um, older than that. And we are lucky um, that we have an infrastructure bill uh, from DC, specifically in Illinois. An incident like this makes me think about the 26,000 uh, plus bridges we have in the state of Illinois. Some of, the major, uh, some of them are major bridges. Some of them are county and township bridges. And some of them are extremely old. 
Um, we are lucky in the state of Illinois that we have a rebuilt Illinois you got that you alluded to, Alex, earlier, uh, to a tone of $33 billion. A lot of it is slated for bridges. I know the component from Washington, D.C. for IIJA does have a bridge component to it, and we are lucky in Illinois that we've got, we are receiving around $1.4 billion, which we intend to invest uh, in all the bridges we have in the state of Illinois. I want to remind everybody that it's not just those bridges in, the, in, in, in minority communities. The state of Illinois is 102 counties, and there are a lot of bridges out there that are, 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 uh, are uh, taken care of by townships, and a lot of those are, are, are very, very old bridges, and a lot of the counties in the state of Illinois are economically, what you would term economically disadvantaged counties. And uh, the investment that is coming from DC and from rebuilt Illinois is exactly what we need. I would just add to that, uh, the state of Pennsylvania, I think has the third most bridges in the country at over 25,000 bridges. And certainly we're glad that everyone's okay. But a lot of us have spent the last 20 to 30 years lobbying for a bill like this. So the, the timing, this isn't anything that's new. And as, as Omar said, there are, uh, the average bridge age, I think, in the state of Pennsylvania is over 50 years old. So it's, it's critically important that we do this uh, and that we fix our infrastructure. I think uh, the governor of Michigan, Governor Whitmer, just had her state of the state address and mentioned that over the last two to three years, with some of the funding that's been available in Michigan, uh, we've repaired over 900 bridges. So this is just a small number of the things that we need to do, but we need to keep pushing forward. Yeah, first, let me say, uh, Alex, thanks for, for having us today. This is a very, very important discussion, and especially on a day like this. Uh, first, my heart goes out to Yasmin, the director of the uh, Pennsylvania DOT, uh, because we are all Yasmin uh, when it comes to infrastructure. Somebody once asked me, what, what really keeps you up at night? It is incidents like this. And, you know, th this kind of uh, incident doesn't develop overnight. Uh, when you don't have enough resources to take care of all infrastructure, you find yourself trying to uh, do what you can to hold things together. I'll give you a good example. We have a bridge out here in, uh, in our state in Wayne County, which is right next to a very major uh, Ford uh, uh, plant, uh, Miller Road. We've got about 500 temporary supports holding that bridge together right now because the bridge is so old. The, the original uh, support uh, system could no longer hold that bridge together, but we didn't have the money to fix it. So we had to continue putting temporary supports in there to hold it together. With this bill, we've been able to get some money now to replace that bridge. But these are the kind of challenges as a, a DOT director that we face on a daily basis. And again, uh, my heart goes out to the folks in Pittsburgh. I'm glad to, to hear that there was no fatality. Thank you. And, and, and uh, Director, if I can add to that is, uh, I think someone mentioned the impact on DEI and uh, you know, on, on in instances in incidents like, like this. What people also forget, we were very lucky this time that we didn't lose any life. However, people need to understand that sometimes these structures are the only connection from some people, from some neighborhood to job centers. And when these things happen, they do impact livelihood uh, of you know, workers, regular workers in, in America. So I think that that's another thing to remember is we're lucky, yes, we don't have a loss of life, but what else does that mean for some communities to have lost access to maybe economic centers, you know, also in social uh, services. And uh, this is why transportation is really uh, primary, central to the quality of flight that we enjoy here. It is why it is so important that the IIJ, it took almost 20 years of lobbying for this to happen, but um, it is overdue. And we're hoping to, like in Michigan, we have the bridge bundle program and some of those uh, instances where we are prioritizing all of these critical repairs. And so we're hoping that that will help us at least to, you know, move up a little bit in terms of the quality and the, also the structural 
state of some of those structures and the system that we are riding on every day. I have to echo everything you just said, Regine. Um, I'm so um, happy that there was no loss of life, but that quality of life and the time, um, that parent who is taking their kid to school or trying to pick up their kid um, or trying to get from here to there has been disrupted. Um, and when that happens, it's just spiral of things that keep going on. Um, so we just have to be mindful and happy that we have this infrastructure bill and take each project in a priority order that um, I'm sure both the directors know which of their bridges uh, need more attention to, uh, and we'll be addressing that. But it does affect the quality of life. And just the fact that um, everyone who uses that bridge now has to find a different way and means to get in there. You just don't fix it overnight and say it's back up again. So yes. Well, and I want to follow a bit up on, on what you just said, Tanya, I think Regine brought up as well. When you have, again, these, these big moments uh, of, of failures of our system and you know it isn't just the bridge collapsing and, and the repair effort that might be involved i think we all saw there's an image of a public bus on on the bridge this morning you know those are folks that use that bus line that if that bridge is now closed for six months let's just say um it's it's definitely a bigger challenge than someone who might have access to their own private vehicle um to deal with with you know a major artery potentially being in, inaccessible um, so I'm curious in, in, in certain instances like this, um, when there, you know, the impacts on certain communities are, are going to be a lot higher, the longer term impacts beyond, you know, the, the cleanup and, and repair effort, in what ways can officials and, and other folks in the infrastructure community bring up these issues of, you know, equity, of access, um, that certainly pop up on a lot of these cases, but may not be top of mind when the actual incident at hand is, is top of mind um, on a day like today. I think the big thing is that um, talking to the people who live in that community, who use that bus, who use that train, talking to them and reaching out. It's easy for me to say, oh, do X, Y, and Z. But if I'm not one using it, it's hard for me to say. So it's that community outreach. It's that citizens group out there. It's the, the local alderman or mayor who is ever there connecting with the people who are truly affected by it. It's easy for me to say something else, but that's when you get to that grassroots and finding out what's going to help this particular community at this particular time with this particular incident. I think it is key. I, I think that's that's right on, Tanya. The, the infrastructure bill is an incredibly important first move to start unraveling the inequities in the U.S. highway system and, and urban centers. And it's kind of launching a new era of infrastructure planning with new ideas and principle. And firms like ours and the private sector uh, can work with the public sector to bring the issue of equity to the center uh, kind of of our planning strategies. And like you said, you know, our firm is expanding its network of community partners and researchers and leaders of grassroots organizations and analysts and others who have really been at the forefront of addressing the issues of equity. So this, this is really just the beginning. And as an industry, uh, we can kind of hone the best practices and establish new ways of, of thinking about our infrastructure in the country. But as you said so eloquently, Tanya, it's about the people and, and reaching out to the people in the communities to see what they need. Did that bridge have a sidewalk where people could walk across it? Uh, could, could people uh, ride their bikes across it or was there not enough room? Uh, before we build it back, we wanna make sure we take all of those things into account. Absolutely, and if I may add on to that, uh, I agree with both of you. Uh, on that notion of it's about the people, uh, from my vantage point, at least uh, that I think of it in terms of a policy, I think Alex, you mentioned a, a bus on the bridge and which I have seen um, on news too. And that makes me think of the multimodal nature of our infrastructure. It's not only about that bridge, it's about that bus, it's about that uh, Metra ride, or it's about that CTA in Chicago. Uh, a lot of time in urbanized areas, specifically minority and disadvantaged uh, uh, areas, the only ride that's available is the, if that uh, passenger rail, if that CTA line, and that's, and this is specifically um, for our essential workers. 
And if we don't take care of, uh, of, of other modes of transportation and just concentrate on, on highways and bridges, I think we, uh, we, we, we're gonna be failing our own people. There's gotta be some equity um, in, in, in the way we fund all modes of transportation. It's gotta be looked at holistically. And I know the IIJA and, and we built Illinois um, is taking us in that direction in a good way. So I'm happy to, happy to see that, but this incident today just illustrates how critical it is, our infrastructure is and how multimodal, everything is interconnected in a multimodal way, if you, if you think, of, think about it from that perspective. Yeah, I, and I have to jump in and agree with Omar on that. Uh, a multimodal uh, uh, transportation system, to me, is also a public health issue. When you build a system that has wide sidewalk, bike paths, and you know a good uh, a, a transit system along with it, you you the equity piece. That means people can get out of their homes and walk. You know, uh, ride their bikes and feel a, a, a sense of uh, a belonging, a part of the, the community. So the the to have a, having a multimodal uh, uh, transportation system, I think it, you know it's it's all about the equity and inclusion. Yes, thank you, Director Ajiba, for saying so because we this is something we witness in Southeast Michigan. Every day, I remember a few years back, the CEO of Wayne County, Mr. Warren Evans, actually wanted to demonstrate how hard it was for someone who lives in, in, in Detroit, in the city of Detroit, to access job centers uh, that are, are in the suburbs. And he left downtown Detroit to go to a job at Best Buy in Novi. It took him two hours to reach his destination. But not only that, as you mentioned, Director Ajeba, it wasn't just the fact that it took him two hours, but he had to stop, walk sometimes alongside highways where people were speeding at, you know, really at high level of speed. And also there were no sidewalks. So that was dangerous. That was time. And so uh, very often we wonder about people want working and wanting to having access to work so that you know, so that we can enjoy a better quality of life for everyone. So multimodalism is very important. Access for all is extremely important, but I think it's also in how we do it. I think very often we as engineers, we come somewhere, we, we try to, we see a problem. The first thing we do, we say, oh, we have a solution, we're going to solve it. And I think we need to stop and then we need to, you know, involve the community into the process we call co-creation. So they identified what their needs are and the solution that work best for them. And, then, and in doing so, then the system will meet their needs and where they, what exactly they need. And, and I think sometimes we need to stop and think, yes, we, no, we don't have all the answers. What we do have is the technical skills to bring these answers to reality, to build a better environment, but we have to take clues on what actually we should be building from the communities for which we build. That last mile is a real issue out there, truly, when you're trying to come out to the suburbs from a major city or just trying to get somewhere for employment opportunities. It's, it's a critical issue. I guess I just wanted to, to piggyback on something that was brought up uh, toward the end of this discussion, but you know, and, and maybe moving away from, from the news of, of Pittsburgh, but when you're, you're talking to community groups, external groups outside of you, the state departments of transportation or folks who are engaging on these issues on a day-to-day -day basis, how, um, whether that's in the public sector or private sector, can leaders incorporate DEI into both their project selection and the way holders are consulted as part of this process, especially I'm just thinking, you know, of a, highly organized you know, neighborhood association from a wealthy neighborhood that may have the means and ability to you know, get someone's attention in a way that you know, groups that are historically underrepresented um, across all facets, facets of our society um, may not just have the ability to organize and, and get that attention or, or show, you know, hey, here is what we as a community value in you know, this new infrastructure project or you know, these repairs that might be coming down the pike. How can, how can leaders like all of you on this panel 
incorporate groups that may just simply be harder to reach and harder to talk to? I think, um, so when I look at, that at my firm, OHM Advisors, this is our 60th year in business. And it was about 10 years ago, we saw an opportunity to bring planning and architecture and engineering under one roof. And, and when I think and look at how things were designed 50, 60 years ago, it was all about just the engineering and, and moving traffic from point A to point B. Um, but, you know, starting about 10 years ago, and, and we call ourselves the community advancement firm uh, with the goal of putting people first, which is a central component uh, of what we're talking about today. And it's critically important to listen uh, and, and understand the needs of the communities that we serve, as you just mentioned, uh, but also to value the differences in, in both perspective and voice. And every infrastructure decision has the potential to have an overlooked community impact. And we've learned a lot over the years and now have systems in place to obtain uh, that crucial information from residents and stakeholders, businesses and community leaders in, in advance of starting a project. And I know one of the jobs in Michigan that is often talked about is I-375, uh, which you know brought a, a main interstate right into downtown Detroit, but it just blew up a neighborhood, uh, which is referred to as Black Bottom neighborhood. And the types of impacts that we're talking about, when you, when you cut a neighborhood in half, uh, where were the restaurants? Where were the barber shops? All of that kind of commerce, when you throw something down the middle, it makes changes. And we think that uh, today is just a great time to be able to fix some of those wrongs that, that were created. And to, uh, to, to John's, John's point is that th those kind of decisions that were made then without the, the, the community's involvement, uh, you know, the I-375 John mentioned uh, that blew up the, the Black Bottom uh, neighborhood. It, it, you also destroyed generational wealth, right? The, the, the barbershop, the, the uh, cleaning cleaners, uh, you know, uh, the, the movie theater, whatever. They never got a chance to transfer that wealth to the next generation and the next generation after them. We, we may have paid them an equitable amount for the, for the property at that time, but what, not having them been part of that decision, I, I think it's something that we are now learning. We can't make those kind of mistakes anymore. And it starts with, with planning. Uh, the planning process, I think it's gotten way much better than the 60s when I-375 was built. The planning process now is a, it's an inclusive process. You have to get the community uh, involved and, and engage them in what, you, what you're trying to do. And in most times, it, it, when you put your environmental documents together, the, the, the feds wants to make sure that you, you've checked all the boxes and before you, you can move on to the next step. So I think we, we've gotten better, been more inclusive, but uh, the, the equity piece is still something that we, we uh, our generation and next generation has to continue to work on. You know, it's interesting because we have these projects all across the country. If you look at, at Illinois, I hate to say this, uh, Secretary, but 290 that goes through the west side of Chicago and they hit some more wealthier areas. Um, the fact that you have the ramps getting off in a certain area or not going through communities, which is limiting the amount of um, economics that are going through there, which means right. you have more poverty, you have more crime. Uh, your taxes are down and low and no one's moving into those communities. So I don't know if you want to touch on 290 at all. I think you've done a good job touching on it. However, um, 290 is, is about 13 or 14 mile section um, a, a, on the west side of Chicago that takes over 200,000 cars. And it goes through several neighborhoods, several uh, uh, neighborhoods, some wealthy, some not wealthy. And, and it truly uh, divided communities out there historically. Uh, a lot of the, especially the not so wealth neighborhood, they look at 290 at their main street, but 290 is so old and it needs to be just redone, overhauled. Um, there is a blue line, uh, CTA, uh, it, uh, line that goes right in the middle of, uh, uh, of 290 that needs to be overhauled. That's a primary mode of transportation for a lot of people uh, in around uh, around 290. It's a crucial project for us. 
But that's a perfect example, similar to what Paul and John were talking about in, in Detroit, of how we need to rethink. Uh, it's not just removing the pavement. It's not just uh, you know removing that bridge and putting the same bridge in place. It's how you collectively, in a multimodal way, uh, you know, uh, do the uh, do the biking, do the walking. Thirteen miles stretch that could take you all the way down to Lake Michigan, beautiful Chicago. Uh, that that whole area is just complementary to uh, to a historic city like uh, like Chicago, historic neighborhoods. A lot of it is. Um, African American, a majority African American neighborhoods that have experienced a lot of floodings too, uh, just right adjacent to 290. So when we we hope when we redo I 290, we not just redoing I 290, we are redoing uh, some of the uh, adjacent streets. We are redoing the drainage system, and we are enhancing the quality of life uh, for the Maywoods, for the uh, Braywoods, and, and and the likes. So that's I, a perfect example. Thank you. I, I think, and I was okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. John. No, I I was going to mention that uh, yes, it starts with the community. They have to be involved in the process. But one thing we don't want to forget either is that transportation. The transportation industry is a big engine of development and wealth generation. And so those solutions, you know, for the community with the community. That's not just enough. We also need to look at how do we spread a lot of that wealth. I'm referring here to transportation, to hubs, which is historically underutilized businesses. How do we bring them into and so they can also benefit from uh, the IG and the bills and the wealth generation that, that you know, the transportation industry brings about. So I think that's also a very important piece of it is because even for the IG, we were reminded the other day by the US Chamber of Commerce that minority businesses, women-owned businesses were instrumental in passing, in helping to pass the IIGA. And so as a result of that, we really need to look at their involvement as not just an obligation or a requirement, but as a matter of fact, as a key differentiator in how we do, we, we deliver work. And also that helps the community in which we're working to be able to have young children see themselves in the people who are bringing solutions to those areas. And so they see themselves, they get motivated, and then we can attract more, you know, children probably from the socially, you know, uh, from the social, economic, socially, you know, uh, disadvantaged class, you know, from uh, to participate because we have a lack of talent we know that we're all fighting for the same talents we have a large bill we already and that's a, another issue also we want to talk about is how do we open doors so that people can build and that generational wealth and, and access opportunities workforce development is one how do we teach people apprentice, apprenticeships and also development of skills certification so that they can participate in this renewal of their neighborhoods. And I think that's a lot of things. And what are the projects that we prioritize? Are those multimodal? Are those that help us give access to center, job centers from people who usually don't have? So I think there are other areas of influence that we also need to look at in order to really move the needle on equity in transportation. Thank you. So, Alice, can I, can I just dip in on something really quick yeah, uh, that Regine just brought up? It's the fact that both Michigan and Illinois both have excellent training programs. Um, uh, Michigan has their TDP program, Transportation Diversity Recruitment Program. IDOT has their HCCTP, Highway Careers and Construction Training. And all of this is needed to make sure that we have equity, equality, inclusion, and diversity. The other component is working with our grade schools we have a project in Chicago called CREATE. It's a real project and it busts behind four grade schools. So how do you come in and do a major project in the community and don't include the community, but including those students to let them understand what the project is, who's working on the project. And Regine, you're so right. They need to see people who look like them so they can understand that they can participate. What we've done with the CREATE program is that we've gone into the grade schools. We've given over $400,000 to four grade schools, the library and the museum to ensure that students in that community understand the project. They're a part of it. 
making sure when they go home, they tell their parents about the project, you know, that they can understand it. But the other part is giving internships. A project that is 10 years long, if you get someone a sophomore, they can be an intern while in high school, an intern while they're in college, and then come back to the community and work on that project. That is the way we show our young people the opportunities out here. Someone once said, how do you get more black planners? Well, you have to know what a planner does first to be a planner. Absolutely, Tanya. And, and one of the things that we did, uh, I signed the, the CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion Pledge uh, in 2020 on behalf of OHM. And that really publicly proclaimed our uh, diversity and inclusion goals, which including uh, cultivating diverse talent in the industry and students, as you mentioned, in, in high school. And we're real proud. We've given away $50,000 in total scholarships uh, just since 2018. And I think we've uh, given those to uh, something like 39 students and providing high school and college interns that are interested in STEM careers firsthand uh, experience by working uh, with the various disciplines at our firm. And I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned the TDRP because I, I know certainly for Michigan, uh, MDOT and Director Adjaba kind of pioneered that. Uh, and that partners with uh, HBCUs, Historically Black Colleges and Universities and it really helps offer uh, training and job shadowing to the undergrad students that are pursuing engineering and other transportation related careers. And uh, you know, recruiting and training and cultivating a diverse group of talented experts, uh, you know, our work is, is grounded in the need to help communities, as I mentioned, and, and solve problems uh, that make places better for all. Uh, and, and we realized that it, you know, in order for our, our DEI action plan to be successful, we need to look at our, our mission internally uh, as, as well as, as externally. If I may, uh, first of all, Paul, I, I truly applaud you and applaud your effort on the program you have. You know, you, um, I know you and I talked about it and I'm, I'm trying to implement the same thing here in Illinois. Um, it's a great program, especially uh, you and I both graduated from uh, Historically Black College in Prairie View and Southern University. Um, and it's incumbent upon, upon us to reach out and, 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 and diversify our ranks, especially on the technical side, uh, from Historically Black Colleges, from uh, colleges that has uh, uh, majority Hispanic uh, students and the like. You know, we need to diversify. It's really crucial. Uh, our internal um, workforce and our internal uh, employees must look like this that we re will represent. Tanya, you did talk about the HTCT program. It's a great program for us. If I may highlight that just a little bit, uh, it's, it's a joint effort between us and, and, and Federal Highways. We, um, we actually support 12 community colleges uh, where they actually do a 10-week intensive course, especially in, in disadvantaged areas, uh, where we're trying to get um, uh, uh, the people to join the trades, be, be a carpenter, be a laborer, be a, an operating engineer, be, whatever it is, but we give you that tool, um, and hopefully, we, we are hoping that they'll join the transportation rank, they'll, uh, they'll work in transportation uh, for us. But that is not necessarily what we're asking them to do. We want, we, if they want to go and work somewhere else and use that uh, uh, experience and that learning that they just had, and that's fine by us. All we are uh, trying to do is trying to get them to a point where they could get uh, some gainful um, employment and where they could uh, create that uh, wealth and create a family that Regine talks about. So I'm glad you mentioned uh, the actually CTP. It's a great program for us and, and we're gonna to continue to do that. Well, uh, I, I agree with all the panelists here and I'm, I am, I have no doubt everyone on this panel is very committed to having a diverse workforce. Having a diverse workforce starts with leadership. And if the organization sees that the leader is committed to this, it trickles down in the organization. Uh, workforce development is something we've taken very uh, seriously. And we, we go out aggressively and recruit. Um, and as I must say, we know um, last year we had almost 60 students here in Michigan from all walks of HBCU uh, schools. 
we know we're not going to hire all of them. But if they can leave Michigan with the training, they can use that to get jobs in wherever state they would like to stay at. Tanya mentioned, uh, how do you, you know, uh, what, what does a planner do? The only way you expose students to this is by having them touch it, feel it, experience it. Then they'll decide, yes, this is probably a career I want to get into. But without that, that, that strong emphasis at the top, it, it, it does not, it, it, then you're going to see a missing link there somewhere. The reason why we created the, the uh, uh, chief cultural equity and inclusion position at a deputy director level is because we wanted to show the organization and our external uh, stakeholders that this is very important moving forward. And as I mentioned earlier, it starts with planning. We, we put our planning division under this new deputy director because we believe everything, again, starts from there. And then uh, on the workforce development side, we also put that under the, the, this new chief cultural equity officer. So again, it, it, it starts at the top and then it, it, it trickles down. I, I just wanted to add to that, one of the really eye-opening things on the TDRP program that, that we're working with MDOT and as well as a lot of the firms on the call, um, what was eye-opening to me is a lot of these students, and, and maybe they're from Georgia or South Carolina or Louisiana, uh, they may not have a car or access to a car or be able to get a plane ticket and all these types of things. So when M MDOT ran the program, uh, they were able to run it one way uh, but as we worked with, with Paul and his administration, uh, we were able to find different ways because we weren't in a position to give every intern a, a truck per se, uh, but there were different ways where we could work with stipends and, and housing. Uh, but without providing some of these things, we don't have the, the access to those students. And I think everyone on this call knows that we're in an industry uh, where we need access to uh, engineers and, and planners and architects uh, because there aren't enough of them and there's a lot of work to be done. So this has been a wonderful program for us uh, to tag team with the state on uh, to, to find ways to create opportunity. So I, I wanted to ask um, a, a question. I think it's fair to say, it's certainly from the administration's perspective right now, there's a large emphasis with this infrastructure law um, and certainly from Secretary Buttigieg about you know, funding non-car centric uh, forms of transportation, expanding you know, electric vehicle charging networks. Uh, but I'm curious, in, in some instances, some of those priorities may conflict with a lot of underrepresented communities just by nature of the way our infrastructure works that may actually be more reliant on cars to get around uh, than you know, a bus that, that doesn't run to the warehouse where they might work, but you know, might be helpful if you work at the law firm downtown. And so I'm curious of how it, moving forward, you, you balance the needs with, with neighborhoods that maybe weren't designed with, with other modes of transit in mind 30, 40 years ago, that as a result, uh, you have a lot of folks where, you know, putting in a bike lane, they see that as that doesn't help me, that, that makes it harder to park my car, that makes it harder for me to get to work in, in, on an off hour. Um, I don't work a nine to five. Um, how do you balance those concerns with, I think, the administration's focus on, on wanting to expand alternative modes of transportation that are not as car-centric. Um, Alice, I, I think you alluded to it. Each, each and every location is unique. Each and every location is different. That's where the uh, where data-driven process comes in. Um, you cannot apply the same policy holistically. You strive to do it because you know the multimodal nature of, of our transportation system is crucial and they have to work together. But you must have the data to back up whatever decision you make. And for example, in, in, in Illinois right now, we have what you would call a House Bill 253. It mandates uh, that the, the Illinois DOT and the transit um, uh, site uh, and the transit sector rather, when we embark on a new project or when we go through the uh, project uh, prioritization and project selection process, we must have a data driven process. We must be, be in a transportation, in a, in, a transfer, in a transparent way rather, and we must uh, tell the public, uh, how did we arrive at that decision? What data did you use? 
and be transparent uh, about it. So the data-driven side of project selection is, is really, really crucial. You know, this is a major in investment. This is a generational investment uh, from the federal side and from the state DOT, uh, from the state side too, especially in, in Illinois. And, and we must be judicious about how we are using this newfound wealth, so to speak. Yes. Oh, I, I agree with Omar. I, I think you have to look at each area uh, on its own. Uh, to me, I think you mentioned, Alex, uh, I, working at a law firm, you, you took a bus to downtown. That's, you know, having a fixed route. There's a lot of underserved community that can't even get walk to that fixed route to catch the bus. So creating a micro transit system and and making sure that it is funded appropriately so that the ones who don't even have a car or bicycle to get to that bus stop or to get to, to, to uh, a doctor's appointment or grocery store, they can just call a, 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 a micro transit uh, uh, van and, and, and they get picked up. And it also creates independency, right? I think again, uh, the, the multimodal piece is, is very, very important. There's still this mindset that only poor people ride buses, right? Or the or public system. And that's really not true. Whenever I go to meetings in Washington, I, I walk across the street from the airport, get on Metro, because I like to use that time to sit down and, 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 and catch up on my emails or whatever the case may be. So I, I think the, the, the paradigm shift has also got to take place. Uh, Regine mentioned, uh, 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 Executive Officer Warren Evans uh, demonstrating where there's so much missing link in our transit system earlier. I think one of the biggest opportunity we missed here in Southeast Michigan was years ago when we were talking about transit, uh, uh, creating an RTA, was that there, there was a, a profile of a guy that gets up early in the morning and walks so many miles to catch a bus to go to, to get to work. And Everybody felt so bad about it. They bought him a car, a, a dealership, uh, you know, donated a car, and the issue went away, and the RTA uh, bill failed. But we did not take a dig, deep dive and look at this thing holistically. That how many of them are out there that are doing the same thing? That uh, their story has not been told. So again. Each area has its own unique uh, challenges, and that I think is the way we have to look at designing our system. I have Thank to you, Director. Actually, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry about that, Regine. I was going to say as we talk about that gentleman, I live out in the Schaumburg area. When I first moved up here from Springfield, Illinois, you can get across Springfield easily. Well, it's less travel time. When I moved up here, I did not have a car. I lived less than three miles from the DOT. It took me two and a half hours by bus to get there. I had to go to the train station, which I was not going to ride the train, to connect to another bus that took me to the mall, that took me close to the office, and then I had to walk the rest of the way. We have to look at each area differently and the needs of each person who are trying to get to where they're going to. It's essential. And I had a nice paying job. I just didn't have a vehicle at that time. So it, it's all economic levels who have that. Yes, thank you, Tanya. I, I just wanted to say that I don't necessarily see it as conflicting. I see it as an extension of the transportation network to make it holistic and to give people choices. I own a car, but perhaps if I had a good transportation, transit, public transit system, I would make different choices. I think it's all about having different options. And also, I think it's, it's a matter of safety, public health and safety. I was in Houston, Texas last week, and I was speaking to a commissioner down uh, in, you know, in, in Texas, and he was talking, telling me that he lived about three blocks from the downtown office, you know, HNTB's office, and he mentioned that he remember being a child and riding his bike and walking, coming downtown to buy candies and ice cream, et cetera. And today, if he were to do that, he would probably not survive the first 500 feet of his you know, bike ride. And that's when we talk about 
why can't we share the world, right? So we build now facilities that allow for a car to go as fast as it needs to be, but also provides, you know, infrastructure for someone who wants to walk and someone who wants to bike and have a healthier uh, lifestyle. I, I lived in Montreal for a few years. I worked on a P3 project there and you'd be surprised the number of our employees and engineers who, or you know, planners, everyone working in the industry who would actually drop their cars in the summer and ride their bike three, four miles in the morning and same in the afternoon to go to work and to go back and farm. And so that really got me into thinking about, you know, why couldn't we? And my daughter, who was at the time, uh, who live, who live with me because she was going to school when we returned home. And I asked her to invite her friends uh, to visit. She'd tell me, but mom, what am I going to do? How am I going to drive them around? Because I don't drive. I don't have a driver's license because as a result of living in Quebec, she never needed one. And so I, I think we sell ourselves short when we talk about you know, conflicting, you know, and we have priorities because even bikes and buses need good roads to travel on, so. I, I was just gonna add to that. Uh, the good news, Alex, is our industry really has a lot of brilliant minds to help solve those problems. When you look at government infrastructure funding, it's historically been meant to make the economy work more efficiently. And freeways and rail lines would speed the goods from factories to market and roads and transit systems would carry uh, workers from their homes to their jobs. But for many communities of color, uh, those projects devastated those existing communities, which really cut uh, black neighborhoods off from downtowns and accelerated the uh, suburbanization trends and exacerbated, quite frankly, uh, segregation. So a lot of the previous government investment in infrastructure really uh, excluded these communities. So if we look at uh, where we really need to invest in infrastructure now, a lot of it is concentrated in these communities. So uh, while it's wonderful to say uh, that, you know, the historic advancement will advance racial equality, it's, it's really going to take a concerted effort at all levels, which involves getting the opinions of all those people. Is it bike lanes? Is it bus routes? Is it extending rail lines? And we want to make sure that the funds are distributed in a way that, that really has significant impact so that all parties uh, will be able to willfully contribute uh, to the full inclusion and participation of uh, residents so that everyone can benefit from innovative policy solutions. So I had a question uh, from the chat from, from Ellen, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit here, um, but she's interested in how the the infrastructure spending, especially the spending that's coming down the pike, is going to help with climate change mitigation. Um, and I would just add to that, you know, how does that intersect with, with DEI initiatives that are present um, both in government and outside of government to make sure that, you know, infrastructure, new infrastructure that's being built or infrastructure that's being repaired or rebuilt um, is both resilient, but also responsive uh, to, to different communities at different income levels? Oh, I, I think that's a great question, Alex. It, it's going to help tremendously. Uh, this past summer, uh, 2021, here in, uh, in Michigan, we had a 100-year flood and a 500-year flood within a, a two-month period where our freeways were flooded. Cars were stuck on the freeways, not because we did not uh, do the right thing. I did most, some of our freeways here in the Southeast Michigan are depressed freeways. And we have pump stations that, that pumps the water out of the freeway uh, and into the lakes. But when you have pump stations that are, are being fed by uh, electricity, it's like having a sump pump in your basement. When it, when it rains, the, the sump pump uh, you know, kind of pumps the water out. But in this case, there was power failure, so our, our, our freeways got flooded. And even some of the ones that did not, that did, did have power, getting the water out of the, uh, out of the freeway was a little slower. Because again, our, our system was not designed for that kind of uh, rainfall within a very short period of time, right? Our outlet pipes are like four inch, inch pipes. So with, with this new funding, we have to look at our, new, our design standards. Replace, you know, 
make the, the outlet pipes bigger. Uh, uh, again, uh, rethink how we, we, we get water off the freeway, maybe build a tunnel, like what we're doing on, on one of our projects on I-75 um, in, in Oakland County. So these, we have to continue to rethink how uh, our system operates. So this is, that's a, a great question. And I think it's going to cost a lot of money, but it's something you have to do systematically over a, a long period of time. You just have to be committed to it. Right. Uh, and I absolutely agree. I agree with Paul on this. If I may take this from a different angle, I think, Tanya, you mentioned CREATE. CREATE project is a great partnership between the state of Illinois, uh, city of Chicago, Cook County, and, and, and the rail industry up in Chicago. Uh, it, is, it, it is massive in its, in its nature. It started back in 2003. We're halfway uh, through our projects, about 70 projects altogether. When Tanya talked about uh, the CREATE projects uh, in some certain neighborhood, uh, we're talking about 75th CIP project is almost $500 million project. But what that project is doing to the neighborhood, specifically an African-American neighborhood, is opening up the landscape. Now you're seeing a lot of great sap uh, all over the place. Now you're seeing a, an ease of uh, people moving around and not being stuck waiting on a train to go by. Uh, from environmental perspective, of course, uh, that is less carbon uh, print for us. Um, it's easy access for people to get to where they need to go. Uh, a lot, you know, a better investment for that community. Uh, so it's, it's huge for us. And, and because of what we're doing on 75th CIP, and we have a lot more projects yet to come in our rebuilt Illinois, uh, the governor and, the, uh, and I that have decided to include another 400 a million dollars so we could take care of the uh, of the rest of the create project that is one aspect that uh, that is extremely helpful especially on the uh on the environmental side um one other area that we try to concentrate on specifically on the transit um uh, side is upgrading our buses upgrading our transit uh stations throughout the state just a couple of uh, days ago uh, the governor have announced around uh, around 59 transit projects ac across the state of Illinois. And a lot of them dealt with uh, uh, some of the transit agencies having the ability to buy electric buses or having the ability to um, install an electric bus charging station within their facilities. So that's the trend we are looking, that's the trend we are supporting. Um, and, and that's good. Uh, from a, a climate change perspective for us. So we have about uh, two to three minutes left. I, I just wanted to ask uh, quickly, probably to both um, commissioners on, on the call here, um, when can we expect um, new projects or, or projects that are coming with the new federal dollars uh, to start showing tangible uh, effects, whether that's you know moving forward in, in terms of construction or rebuilding in in Illinois and Michigan, what what would you say to someone who says, "Hey, when's when's this money going to affect my life?" Right, right. If I um, Paul, if I may talk about that just a little bit. First of all, the uh, federal infrastructure bill is a five year bill. It's not a one year bill. Um, in the state of Illinois, we have a six year program. Uh, so between the six year program and the five year program from the federal side overlapping it each and every um, April or May time frame is one IDOT issues uh, the multi-year program. That's specifically on bridges and, 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 and roadway side. We already bearing fruit from the federal side that the $1.4 billion I talked about earlier for bridges, uh, we get in our, uh, our first installment. It's around $275 million specifically for bridges. We're gonna take that uh, new cash flow and incorporate that in our multi-year program. And that's what you're gonna see every year. Uh, we, we anticipate to see that kind of cash flow, uh, depending on what line item we're looking at, whether it's for bridges, whether it's for roadways and, 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 and other modes of transportation. So we should be able to see soon. Uh, the, bridge, uh, the bridge funding side is clear for us. Others, I know our partners in uh, with FHWA and USDOT, they are working diligently um, 
trying to do the rulemaking and, and, and they have been telling us uh, that in the near future, they're gonna be announcing the other line items uh, other than bridges. Uh, for, for us in Michigan, uh, we have a five-year program. Uh, uh, as Omar said, the, this bill is five-year period. So overlapping those together, obviously, with, with our current five-year program. And uh, with our governors, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this starts with leadership. We have a governor that's very committed to infrastructure. She gave us $3.5 billion when she came in and said, go out there and fix all these bad roads. We were talking about the Pittsburgh Bridge earlier. Right now in the state of Michigan, we have about 59 bridges that are shut down because they can no longer carry that load of that, uh, the weight of that traffic. So she said, I want all these bridges open as soon as possible. And so uh, when you mentioned when we're we gonna start seeing construction on, on the uh, federal infrastructure bill, I would say by, by next year, you will start seeing some of these projects getting trickled out because we have a, a backlog of projects that we had already been designing and putting on the shelf anyway. Within that five-year program, we, we can start getting them out. And I, I think with the oversight issue, as Omar mentioned, we're still waiting for some of the details of, of, of what the bill will allow us to do or not do. Until we get all that in, I think uh, I, I would say probably closer to late next year before we start letting out projects with, with, the, with the federal money. Awesome, well, thank you so much everyone for coming. I know we're, we're a little bit, a uh, couple minutes over time, um, but you know we, we didn't bleed uh, too far over, um, which is always good. Um, so thank you so much for, for everyone for participating. Thank you for, for everyone who, who joined us uh, on a Friday afternoon. Um, I'm not sure what the weather looks like this weekend in the Midwest. Uh, I'm kind of right on the snow line uh, here in DC, although I think uh, I, I lucked out that I'm not in Boston this weekend. True. Well, thank, thank you. Thanks thank for having you. us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a nice right. weekend. Thank you.